first of all, I must thank uh, Arno Rey and Dan Savone for their very kind invitation. Since I have only five, uh, 25 minutes, I should uh, tell you very quickly what you need to know about religion before um, you go into any further into this uh, dreadful field. Uh, the more I think about this, the more I think that you should stop thinking about religion as such, um, in the sense that uh, there is really no such thing. And I'm aware that it may seem like I'm kind of sawing the branch I'm sitting on or, you know, my professional affiliation, but it doesn't matter, really. Um, because what's really important is, I mean, it doesn't matter, because whatever I say about the non-existence of the object religion as a scientific category, people will carry on talking about religion. So. Uh, but it does matter to understand that what we usually mean by religion uh, corresponds to very different kinds of things. Um, and in particular, that the common idea we have about what religions are is something that happened very recently in human history and evolution. And that matters because of the psychology of religion and the anthropology of religion, um, and recently the evolutionary approaches to religion have been mostly uh, focused on the kinds of phenomena that are very recent in our history. So why should you stop thinking about religion? Because uh, to give you a very um, simple analogy, uh, religion is like trees. You know, there are trees out there, we know that. If you're a landscape designer, if you're a lover of nature, you love trees, you like trees, and trees is a category. But if you're a biologist, uh, trees are not a useful category. There is no such thing as trees. Some ferns are closer to some pine trees than oak trees, and oak trees may be closer to some tulips than uh, other trees. So, and the banana tree, which is the one on the right, is not a tree at all, it's a herb. So, um, there is no useful biology uh, to be done out of a theory of trees. And what I want to tell you is that there are good arguments to think that there's no good psychology to be done uh, towards a psychology of religion. So a better line of reasoning, if we abandon this idea uh, that there is such a thing as religion, is to see what is this religious stuff that people talk about and what do we need to understand in order to understand it. So this is a mini tutorial in all the things you need to know if you want to talk about religion. The first thing you, you need to know, and that's no um, surprise, is that uh, human beings have a spontaneous um, disposition for and preference for uh, liking of um, supernatural combinations of concepts. What I mean by that are things that you find in all sorts of cultural domains where you have what I call conceptual recombinants. Uh, that is, you know, uh, trains that have feelings, um, snakes that have weird uh, biological properties, chimeras, hybrids, all sorts of weird things like that. And this is something that is of great salience to human minds. Um, these are often based on conceptually deep violations, like artifacts that have intentional properties, or objects that can listen to you, or um, intentional agents that are invisible or have no physical properties. Um, the features are for people who like to read about these things. But the, the, the important thing about this is that there are varieties and attractors of these things. That is, there are lots of possible combination, conceptual combinations that are supernatural and of great interest to human beings, but only some of them make it, as it were, in cultural transmission. Uh, floating islands, for example, are found in some mythologies, but they're not a super you know, successful kind of cultural meme, as it were. On the other hand, little fairies, that is, little beings that are sort of physically elusive, but very much like human beings, are things that you'll find everywhere in the form of little spirits, sh uh, goblins, ghouls, or whatever. Or the third thing uh, depicted, it had no idea what that thing is, but I'm sure it's one of those uh, golem-like things that you find in the mythologies of lots of people. Now, these are the sort of background of lots of things that we call religious, in the sense that most of the concepts that we call religious are a subset, a very restricted subset, of these uh, conceptual combinations in the shape of go gods, ghosts, uh, ancestors, and all the other intentional agents like that that happen to be physically uh, unintuitive or counterintuitive, but mentally very much like us. These are sort of more bizarre sort of explorations of these conceptual combinations. Now, 
That is fine, um, but that is found in all sorts of fiction, daydreaming, fantasy, uh, dreams, uh, literature, science fiction, whatever. Um, but there's another item that is a bit more special that we find in lots of uh, culture, which is this special use of a subset of these, um, uh, of these concepts in cults, that is in fairly organized social interactions. And these, in fact, consist mostly of two kinds of um, activities. Um, these are things that we are pretty sure have been found for as long as they were modern, psychologically modern humans. Um, one is the um, special sort of activities uh, centered on ancestors, that is on dead people, but not corpses, but dead people once the corpses have been conveniently sort of uh, pushed aside or dealt with. Um, there's ancestor worship, so-called ancestor worship, in many, many uh, places in the world. Um, you see here examples from um, uh, archaic European societies and from China, I think. And uh, this is almost universal in all societies that have lineages, um, chiefdoms, and things like that. But it's also universal in lots of other, it's also very widespread in lots of other places, as we'll see. Another form of cult that we find, and we're pretty sure was around, more or less, um, with the appearance of uh, modern humans, is notions of spirits and, and, and th some special connection with them through uh, special people. Uh, the assumptions, the conceptual assumptions here are very simple, uh, that, that there are spirits, there are ghosts or ancestors around, and that they have effects on people. That is, they can make you sick or they can make you prosperous or healthy. And that some people, some individuals, have special experiences and capacities in dealing with them. That is probably the most represented form of religious activity that we find in human uh, cultures, and that's probably the one that's been around for most of human evolution, most of human prehistory, and most of human history. So it is the important stuff. The rest is pretty atypical and different. So in supernatural concepts, you have a special subset, which is the ones that are used for cults, that is, ancestors, cult, uh, spirits, ghosts, etc. It's worth noting about these um, uh, cults that they don't come with a doctrine. No one has a doctrine of their spirits in most tribal societies. Uh, that the activities are run by individual spe specialists. That they correspond to pragmatic needs. You know, no one does a religion, uh, uh, so, sorry, no one engages in that kind of religious activity uh, for the sake of doing it. No, it's because someone is sick or to make sure that someone doesn't fall sick or that um, uh, crops are good and abundant and things like that. So it's always pragmatic. And also there's a fair amount of market competition. That is, some specialists are not very good, they get replaced with better specialists. Now I'm moving on quickly to something that we are much more familiar with, but I, I have to insist is pretty atypical in human evolution and prehistory, which is the existence of large-scale societies where what appear uh, is a, what appears is a fairly new phenomenon, which is religions as such. What I mean by that is that um, because of social complexity in, in larger societies, you find the emergence of a class of religious specialists, that is, people who are a, an organization that specializes in the kinds of um, rituals and activities centered on superhuman agency. Now, uh, these are a special class. They have corporate interests, like any organizations. They do very much the same as um, craftsmen, guilds, or other sort of professional groups. They try to maintain uh, a quasi-monopoly of their activities. They, kind to, they try to uh, discourage competition. They have big, sort of large uh, political influence because that's the main way to, to undermine the competition. They work towards a monopoly or a cartel. This is the religion we are more used to. And the important thing about that is that it promotes a kind of re cultural representations that were not seen before. Um, in the sense that um, before religions as such, you have a variety of specialists, you have no established doctrine. The, superhumans, uh, the superhuman agents are local. They're either ancestors or 
local spirits. After that, you have something that is provided by a large organization that is a brand that tells you that the agents are extremely large, that their jurisdiction extends to all sorts of places beyond, you know, uh, small places, that their effects on the world are huge, so they look like they're more powerful. There is no notion anymore that the providers are terribly special, it's just that they're members of an organization, in the sense that, in the same way as your shaman has to be special, but your priest is very much like a tax uh, collector, you know, he's someone who does something because he's placed there by a certain hierarchy. So, in supernatural concepts, we now have the ones that are used for cults, and there's a subset that's used by, um, by organized religions. Finally, we, got an, we get another uh, interesting development, uh, which is something that is very special, but again, that's the, the very special development that we happen to know most about because that's the kind of religions we know, <coughs> which is the appearance of moralizing religions in the actual age. Now, um, this is something that happened in various places in the world, in China, in India, and in um, the Eastern Mediterranean, um, in very much the same way and in very much at the same time. There's the appearance of doctrines that link personal intuitive morality, a sense of what is fair and unfair, to cosmic features. That is, the world is supposed to be fair and the world is governed by gods that are fair. And there are lots of examples of these. Uh, new doctrines. These doctrines then, for historical reasons, conquered the rest of the world through f very much through the um, effect of empires like, you know, in China and the Roman Empire and so on and so much. So, so this is the kind of religion that we are familiar with, but again we have to, rem to remember that it is very exceptional. It's an exceptional historical phenomenon. So again, this is um, this subset of subset of subset. Now, one thing you have to understand is that although religions win the war against, uh, win the battles against uh, the sort of market, the competition from shamans, from inspired mediums and all that, religions always lose the war. And uh, it's interesting, I can't go through all these examples, but in all cases, in all uh, places where there is an established um, official organized religion, you'll find that there is actual competition from, from uh, private personal uh, providers who are, of course, usually disparaged, derogated, or even um, um, ostracized or repressed, but uh, that always happens. So, to finish, I want to tell you very briefly, because I think this should be educational after all, uh, what to say and not to say in polite society when you talk about religion and evolution. Um, and if this is the only thing you remember from this talk, that would be great. So do not say uh, that there's been religion throughout human history or prehistory or evolution. That's not true. Uh, there's been supernaturalism, probably for as long as uh, there were humans, uh, cults in most places, and religions in some. That's a historical phenomenon. Um, try not to say that that is a scientifically important common feature to all things religious, uh, because the scientifically important stuff, either in history or in psychology, are very different in these very different uh, historical phenomena. Uh, don't say that religion promotes conflicts because religions can be used like other things to uh, recruit people for coalitional purposes, but that's not uh, because they're religious, that's because they provide good information for uh, coordination. Do not say that religion promotes pro-social behaviors because um, only actual age doctrines do that, not religions in general. Archaic religions from large-scale societies were largely about amoral gods and they didn't recommend morality, they recommended obedience, which is a very different thing. Uh, well, that's um, a special sort of line against some theories of uh, evolution as, you know, favoring religion because it's pro-social. So evolution doesn't explain religion. No, 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 no. And the reason for that is that evolution doesn't explain non-existent objects. There's no evolutionary theory of trees because there is no biological kind that is trees. So there's no evolution of trees. And this is the one thing that you should remember. Do not try to apply evolutionary reasoning to something that doesn't actually correspond to natural kind in the world. So thank you.
the work that I do focuses on uh, religion and spirituality in the lives of African Americans, and I'm particularly interested in the ways in which and the extent to which people apply ideological systems, their relationship to religious institutions, to a willingness to live well in the world. And so a lot of the work that I do focuses on low-income African American communities. And the outcomes that interest me are outcomes such as compassion and altruism, volunteerism, um, forgiveness. So I'm interested in the ways in which people apply whatever the principles are that they say they believe in to the, the engagement in those kinds of outcomes. So in short, the way that I think of my work is I'm interested in the, the reasons why people choose to live well and lovingly in the lives of others when the circumstances that they are struggling with would, don't necessarily suggest that they should or, or need to. So the, the focus of the time that we're going to be spending today, the, I want to give a really brief overview of the empirical findings uh, in relation to African American life, religion, and uh, psychological outcomes that uh, we tend to study. Talk a little bit about some of the challenges that I think we're facing as a group of people who are interested in the psychology and sociology of religion, but particularly the psychology of religion. Um, in, trying to figure out how to study this work well and do the work well. I want to emphasize some of the themes that I think we need to begin to attend to in the work that we're doing, and then uh, provide some wrap-up comments. And uh, as has been mentioned before, uh, at the end of the panel, we'll all take questions. So, empirical findings. The, there is a relatively large body of work, a growing body of work on religion and spirituality in the psychology of religion, um, and in psychology, generally speaking. And that work is somewhat smaller in relation to African Americans in particular. And the work is not as, as uh, deep and rich as, as one would hope. So much of the work on religion and spirituality in African American life suggests that African Americans are religious, and there's, there are a lot of descriptive studies that ask people how religious are you? How often do you attend church or mosque? Mostly church, because much of the, the research is very Christocentric. So we think about religion and spirituality in sort of three general ways. There's organizational religiosity, um, where we, again, focus on the extent to which people are involved in the formal, organized aspect of religious life. Do they attend services? Are they members of religious institutions? Do they think of themselves as having support from members of those institutions. We ask questions about non-organizational religiosity. Those things that people do that are a part of the sort of ritualistic um, process of engaging in religion, but that, that don't re necessarily require you to be a part of an institution. So uh, the extent to which people engage in things like prayer, uh, listening to religious music, reading religious texts. And then we pay attention to subjective religiosity quite a bit the extent to which people believe themselves to be religious people regardless of what uh, practices they're engaged in and regardless of whether or not they are a part of a religious institution. And the literature, the empirical literature, demonstrates that these three domains of religi religion and spirituality are related in a variety of ways to, to a variety of mental health outcomes like depression, so religion and spirituality uh, are associated with the more religious you are, the, more, the less depressed you report yourself to be, generally speaking. People who are religious tend to report themselves to be generally less anxious, uh, less stressed, less engaged in antisocial behaviors, etc. And there, there is a growing body of work that looks at pro-social outcomes and uh, demonstrates a link between people's uh, articulation that they are religious people and their willingness to engage in positive uh, outcomes. Again, things like altruism, volunteerism, et cetera. The problem is the descriptive literature doesn't help us do what I think we want to do as, as behavioral scientists, which is to sort of drill down into why, is this, why are these empirical relationships showing up in the way that they are? And when, even when the, the empirical relationships are violated, when we don't see a relationship between any of the indicators of religiosity and outcomes like depression or anxiety, what is it that accounts for the circumstances where those relationships don't exist or are negative versus when they're positive? 
So our, the core question is how do we begin to unpack these empirical relationships so that we leave, our, leave with a greater understanding of how religion and spirituality are operating in everyday life? And this, this is a question that guides my work, especially in relation to the lives of African Americans. So I think there are a few challenges that we should be attentive to. Number one, we, in the psychology of religion, we generally tend to look at religion and spirituality as individual level constructs. Um, and we tend to study religion and spirituality as individual level phenomena, um, which in and of itself is not problematic. What's missing though is a, a recognition that religion is a cultural system. So that we, although we practice religion in a, a, an individual way to a certain extent, we are a part of a system, a legacy, um, we're, we're embedded in a, a system that has its own iconography, its own legacy of ideas, et cetera. And we need to begin to think about the ways in which we can bridge those two things. Religion, theology, institutional life, all of those emerge within historical and sociopolitical contexts. And I'm particularly aware of this, and this is going to be a part of the focus of the, uh, my comments today. The historical and sociopolitical context out of which religious systems develop need to be attended to as we think about how religion and spirituality, spirituality may be operating in individual life. But the reality is that as psychologists, who generally study individual processes, trying to figure out how to study the manifestations of cultural systems at the individual level is a particularly difficult uh, challenge. But it's a challenge that we have to pick up. And it, I won't pretend that I'm going to provide an answer to this challenge, but it is something that we, we do need to, to uh, attend to in the work that we do. So that psychological studies of individual faith life have to figure out how to integrate not only the subjective aspects of religious life, but we need to think about how those subjective experiences are layered into communal experiences, familiar experiences, and are situated within historical systems that shape what we believe and how we manifest our beliefs. So it's worthwhile to, to pay attention to the historical context, particularly, and I'm focusing right now on the, the historical context of African American religiosity. Much of the sociological and historical work around African American religious life uh, situates the history of African American religiosity in, in the United States in slavery. And uh, this makes sense to a certain degree, in part because even, it's, it's very clear that uh, Africans who were brought to the United States um, had their own religious and spiritual systems that they had been operating from for generations, right? So, but those systems were essentially eradicated over time and communities were Christianized as a part of the system of, of slavery. So it becomes important to think about the ways in which slavery um, and the variety of, of issues that emerged out of slavery impacted on the religious development of African American people. But and a lot of the discourse around the impact of slavery focuses on racism and oppression and the ways in which those two systems of experience ultimately impacted on the belief systems of and the practices of African Americans. The contemporary theologians and contemporary historians in theology recognize that the history of, of racism and oppression certainly hasn't gone away in the United States. And so the very systems that were at the foundation of the way that we thought about and the, the, how the ideologies emerged are still very much a part of what African Americans have to grapple with in their everyday thinking about what it means to be people of faith, but also what it means to be people of faith in a system that continues to be oppressive. So there are a few things to keep in mind in terms of the uh, historical context of re African American religion. Again, the black church in the United States evolved in the context of chattel slavery and continues to exist in the context of, uh, again, a racist and oppressive political system. But because of the context and because of the nature of faith and, and ideology, faith was the, form, was the foundation for grappling with a range of existential complexities from 
the question of what is evil and how do we manage and deal with evil in the world, to what, how do we understand freedom and the discourse around freedom in a context where people are enslaved or um, struggling with oppression. What does it mean to forgive or not forgive those who are engaged in oppressive action when you also call yourself a person of faith who believes in a God who is forgiving? How do we think about love and compassion, one sense of purpose in the context of um, an oppressive system? How do, you, how, do you re, how do you think about what it means to be a person of dignity and to live a life of dignity in a, in a context that constantly uh, threatens one sense of dignity and humanity? So those are some of the existential questions that uh, African American people who are people of faith had to struggle with through the context and the lens of their faith and continue to have to do. In addition to the existential concerns that religion is applied to, one has to think about the institution. And the institution, the African American church, and the most 95% of African Americans in the United States indicate that they're Christian. The African American church was and is an important institution in part because it was the first institution that was fully owned by African American people. So in a context of slavery, you couldn't own property. But one of the things that, sh that African Americans were able to do over time, especially post-emancipation, was to make sure that they not only uh, came together as religious communities, but that they put money together to buy and build buildings that were owned by the community. And those buildings ultimately became really important to the community because it was the only property that the community owned. And it was independent because it was uh, the only property that uh, was fully owned by African Americans. And the African American church became important in part because the theology within the African American community suggested that if we do believe that God is a loving God and a compassionate God, regardless of the oppressive context that we find ourselves in, as an extension of God's love, this institution, the, the African American church, has to take up the role of extending itself to demonstrate compassion to all others, all those who are within the community, but those who are outside. And so the African American church and African American theology became centered around particular notions of justice, freedom, and the idea that one has to engage in compassionate uh, acts as a part of the authentic expression of faith. So in the context of racial injustice, the African American church became a space where not only were people engaged in thinking about and figuring out how to engage in compassionate action, but it was also one of the few institutions where people, once they entered into that space, were treated with dignity because they were, being, they were engaging in relationships with other African Americans who recognized that regardless of how you were being treated on the outside, you were going to be treated as someone who was loved not only by God but by other members of the community when you were inside the, uh, the house of faith. So the, the African American church became a space where dignity, humanity, and respectability were constantly being emphasized because you couldn't count on it being emphasized anywhere outside. Taking a look at the history of uh, African American churches, theologians who are interested in African American theology argue that, that most African American churches within the United States have adopted over time what they call a liberationist uh, theological perspective. And the, the, that theology is grounded in three basic themes. A focus on love and the idea that divine love should be the center of the way that we think about what it means to be a person who is a person of faith. The idea that Faith makes no sense unless we are using it to try to, to engage in acts of justice and emphasize the importance of justice as an authentic expression of faith. And that faith life, ultimately the belief in God, is tied to a sense of hope, a hope that we are engaged in a relationship with a God who ultimately will not only deliver the African American community and other communities from injustice, but hope for the transformation of the, the entire human experience and for the en entire human world. So these three themes resonate throughout much of uh, African American theology. And interestingly, when you look at the text, not only of religious leaders within African American communities, generally speaking, and of course, I'm painting with a bit of a broad brush, 
But when you look across the, the, um, the discourses of African American people of faith, life, and religious leaders, there is a tendency to use religious texts, particularly the, the Christian Bible, as an authoritative source for challenging oppressive social conditions and for uh, uh, challenging the restrictive roles that are imposed on members of the African American community, but also of others who are in other communities. And that use of religious text uh, as a grounding for, for challenging oppressive systems is the root of the protest traditions and, and traditions of activism in African American communities. It's part of the discourse or, and the logic behind engaging in charitable giving and social justice movements and in self-help traditions. But what I'll argue is that while those, those themes are certainly very important, that there are other themes that are sort of embedded or outside of those, that, those three themes that are really important for us to pay attention to as we begin to do more and more thoughtful work around the, the lives of African Americans, especially in relation to uh, religion and spirituality and their link to the outcomes that we care about. And because I'm interested in pro-social outcomes, I'm particularly interested in these four themes that we hear over and over again in the narratives of African American people of faith in interviews that we do with, with individuals, but also in uh, analyses of sermons and texts from African American churches. And those four uh, theological themes are, number one, the idea that faith is a landscape for contemplating the extraordinary. So, and I'll go into detail in, in each of these, in relation to each of these themes. But the, the notion is that faith life gives us an opportunity to think about the extraordinary contradictions in the human experience and allows us to begin to try to make meaning of those contradictions, especially when those contradictions become overwhelming. The second theme is the notion of divine improvisation, the idea that God is able to do new things that could not possibly be done or could not possibly be contemplated in the, from a human perspective. And that that capacity for improvisation is what leads us to some really powerful outcomes in terms of the way that we interact with each other and the choices that we tend to make. The third theme is a focus on deauthorizing. And the, the, here the, the notion is that while the outside world tells us various things about who we are and what our possibilities are, that one of the functions of faith in the African American community is to replace human expectations with divine expectations and therefore to deauthorize human expectations, especially when those are low. And then the final issue is thinking about what an authentic relationship with God looks like. And this becomes really important in the context of relationships with people who profess to be people of faith but don't behave like people of faith. So the question constantly is, how do you judge when someone is an authentic person of faith and how do you judge when they are not? And how do you live a life that demonstrates that you have your own authentic journey towards faith? So let's take each of these in turn and then um, conclude. The, again, the African American experience is an experience that demonstrates an, an extraordinary arc from a there to a here. So this is a, a picture of, to, of Toni Morrison accepting her Nobel Prize in literature. It's hard sometimes to keep in mind that the, the movement in the African American historical experience, we've moved from chattel slavery to a point where there are clear indicators of success in the African American community in a variety of ways. But that arc is an important arc within the historical landscape for African Americans. We're constantly thinking about how did we get from there 300 years ago to here now? And how do you understand the movement from chattel slavery to a point where you, you have people who are engaged in, in actions that could never have been predicted uh, at that time? So African American theology becomes a context for thinking about what is God's role in that extraordinary historical arc and how do we, how do we think about uh, historicizing our experience in the context of a faith that many people understand as helping us through that arc, um, even though others may not tell our history in, this, in that way. So African American theology becomes a mechanism for understanding that history is an arc of extremes, but that those extremes require us to think differently about what, how faith operates. <laughs>
So the same history that includes uh, a, a legacy of slavery includes a Toni Morrison or a Barack Obama or, or uh, people who are successful in a variety of ways. And the same history that includes pe everyday people who may not experience extraordinary success also include people who are struggling with the systems that are continuing to, in to oppress uh, members of the community and we have to understand how those how people within the context of that arc are related to each other in order to be able to maintain our sense of the humanity of not only the individuals but the, the humanizing re relevance of, of history so one of the ways of making sense of that arc is to think about God as a, a, a figure that has the capacity to improvise and to create new things and African-American theologian Carlisle Fielding Stewart has a, a beautiful uh, piece, that, a, a book that he calls Street Corner Theology, and he, he says, improvisation is the freedom of the mind of God to do something new through the vehicle of God's own choosing. According to the indigenous African-American viewpoint, that vehicle will invariably be one who is repudiated, one who is outside of the established parameters of the acceptable and chosen principle. So this sensibility that God ultimately works in unusual ways to achieve ends that could not be predicted by uh, individuals is important for a number of reasons. But one of the, the implications of this focus on divine improvisation is that it disrupts the expected order of things. You don't expect this outcome from this set of experiences. And so the, the understanding is, but for God, this could not have happened. And divine improvisation, because human beings are not in charge, becomes a wellspring of hope. The expectation that anything is possible from a divine perspective, even again, if human beings can't uh, imagine it. And, you hear the same sensibility in, uh, when you interview African Americans about how they make sense of and make meaning of difficult moments in their lives. And this is a, a, a text from an interview I did with uh, an African American woman. And she says, in relation to the struggles in her life, there are some times when things get so bad, so stressful, and I feel like it's not even worth it. How can I carry this? And why is this happening? And why me? There are all these little poems and all these little verses that I remember in practice. And she gives me an example. She says, when you have come to the end of every light you know, and you're about to step into the dark, faith is knowing that there is something solid for you to step on or you're going to fly. And I tell myself that if there's nothing there for you to step on, girl, you're going to fly, and I have always flown. That sense that ultimately things will be made manifest in your world that will, be, will help you to be able to get to the next good place, and that that happens because of your faith in God is really central. So we have the notion of divine improvisation as the, the source of hope. The other theme, the third theme, is the notion that uh, it is important to deauthorize human expectations, especially lo the low expectations that can lead to our demise, and ultimately to lift up other sources of authority that are much more uh, in line with our survival. And one of my favorite examples of this kind of deauthorization comes from uh, the text of uh, the speech, Ain't I a Woman, from Sojourner Truth. And in response to a man who tells her that she could not, she was not permitted to, to preach because she was a woman, she said, that little man in black over there, he says women can't have as much rights as men because Christ wasn't a woman. Where did your Christ come from? Where did your Christ come from? From God and a woman. Man had nothing to do with him. Like, this, this idea that you deauthorize sexism by highlighting the fact that p patriarchal notions make no sense if you're going to use the Bible as your authoritative source because man had nothing to do with the creation of the very source of um, the faith system that you, per, you believe that you are a part of. And so this, this kind of deauthorizing is not only powerful, but ultimately one of the sources of survival uh, within the community and something that people turn to over and over again. And again, you hear the same sensibility in uh, interviews, or at least I do when I'm doing interviews with African-American men and women. And this is a text from an interview with a woman who's, who I'll call Grace. And this is a woman who at 14 uh, became a mother for the first time. At 16, she was a mother of two boys and lived in a household that 
was as chaotic as one can imagine a household to be. Um, parents who were involved in drug use, um, lots of, of people coming in and out of, of uh, prison systems, et cetera. When I talked with Grace, she had a PhD, and her two sons, one was uh, pursuing his MBA and the other one was pursuing his bachelor's degree. And so she talked about how she got from there to here. And she said, spirituality has helped me go ahead and do things that people told me I couldn't do based on where I was born and what my life trajectory was and my son's life trajectory. And spirituality has allowed me to say, okay, I know those things, I know those are real facts, but it doesn't have to be the truth for us. And this disruption of the relationship between fact and truth, fact being the, the stuff that human beings know and truth being divine, that sort of divine truth that supersedes everything that human beings expect of us and what they would be able to tell as a story of us, that dis, the, the, the disruption of that relationship ultimately is a mechanism for deauthorizing um, human expectations so that one can allow for divine expectations to live out. And the fourth and final theme is the idea that the, the church has to be a source of activism and that that activism, that, that engagement in the world in a just way is the best reflection of one's, the authenticity of one's faith. And African American churches, there are a number of studies that have demonstrated that uh, African Americans expect churches to be engaged in social justice activities. And if one is involved in a church that is not, one leaves that church very quickly. So that there, it's an expectation that churches will have very strong um, outreach missions. And those missions have to be involved not only in the politics of justice, but also in the everyday lives of people. And we see that in terms of the kinds of supports that African American uh, churches provide. So there are studies of, there are national studies of black churches that demonstrate that 89% of African American uh, churches that are considered large churches, churches that have 800 people or more, um, and 98% of, ch of smaller African American churches provide three general areas of support. There are expressive supports that include family counseling, couples counseling and couples ministries, domestic violence supports, child welfare services, um, parenting and, and uh, sexuality workshops. Churches provide what are considered instrumental supports, which are food and clothing for, for families and individuals who simply don't have the resources to provide those on their own. Uh, churches are sources of emergency financial aid, so if, if one is unable to pay one's bills, one can turn to the, the church for financial help. Um, it is a shelter for the homeless and provides home care services. And the final uh, area of support that churches, has, uh, the research demonstrates that African American ch churches provide are joint expressive and instrumental support. So educational supports, and this, this again comes out of the legacy of slavery. So when uh, it was illegal for African Americans to learn how to read and write, African American churches provided opportunities for people to learn those skills. And those, that commitment has continued to this day. Um, so tutoring, Bible classes, cultural awareness courses, Head Start programs, mentoring classes and skill trainings, skills training courses are provided in most African American churches. Now, it becomes important to, to recognize that churches don't provide these services, people do, right? So buildings don't act, human beings do. So church members of the community are deeply involved in providing these uh, opportunities and do so as a part of the uh, expression of, the authentic, of authentic faith. Button is not moving forward. And very quickly, you, you again hear the same sense of, of uh, focus on authenticity when you listen to the way that African American uh, individuals talk about how faith is connected to the decisions that they make in their lives. And the argument over and over again that I hear is that people's sense of gratitude over the, the small things and large things that have been given to them in their own lives, even people who are struggling with poverty, um, that sense of gratitude is connected to a willingness to engage in compassionate act. And uh, Tomas, who is an interviewee um, from a study that I did, says, the way I see it, if not for God, we, would, we wouldn't be here. You know, he breathes the breath of life into us each day, you know, so just to wake us up each day. So if he's doing that much for us, 
You know, the little things that we give of ourselves is like nothing. You know, it's nothing. So that's the least we can do in return. Again, just to, to summarize, the, that notion of gratitude, that idea that even the very fact of being alive, of being woken up today, is sufficient to catalyze your willingness to engage in acts that will at least help and support others. So whether we're talking about volunteerism or altruism or just um, small acts of compassion. And that giving back to others is an acknowledgement and expression of thanks for, um, for the divine gesture of, of simply allowing you to be alive. So to wrap up, what does this mean? It means that if we're going to take seriously the, the a, a, a sort of uh, deeper thinking about how religiosity and spirituality are related to the outcomes that we care about, again, outcomes like pro-social activity, um, like depression and, and um, anxiety, we absolutely need to continue to pay attention to the various domains of religiosity, organizational, non-organizational, -organ and subjective religiosity. And we need to do that in relation to the outcomes that we care about. But we do need to have uh, a willing, we need to think about the ways in which we can look at the, the other ideological aspects of religious and, and spiritual life, and particularly the four themes that I mentioned, in part because they're coming up in people's discourses. So an awareness of divine action in one's personal, interpersonal, and, and uh, the historical arc that we're a part of and understanding how we make sense of the, the real diversity in uh, the experiences that we've had individually and as a community. A focus on divine improvisation and how we understand that to be, to, to, uh, be operating in our individual lives and in the lives of those who are a part of the community. The ways in which individuals deauthorize external forces and sometimes their own internal voices that may be destructive or that may not necessarily promote survival and how that deauthorization operates in the everyday lives of individuals. And then we also need to think about the ways in which the expressions of authenticity occur in the everyday lives of individuals and how all of those things ultimately impact on the outcomes that we care about. And with that, I'll stop. There is much ongoing debate on how we can understand religion in terms of evolutionary psychology. And of course, as you can imagine, or as you already know, there are pro and con arguments. And the majority of researchers today agree across disciplines that perhaps um, the honest answer today is that religion is a byproduct of evolution. Uh, and in parallel to this question, classically in uh, psychology, you have a lot of studies trying to answer the question wh what it is more natural. Is it more natural to be believer or is it more natural to be atheist? And of course, the question has particular uh, significance for uh, children. And today in social psychology, there is a kind of understanding that perhaps the religious cognition in childhood is uh, part of a, a broader continuum on social cognition. Um, in, as it emerges in early childhood, in fact. Um, yeah. And as you certainly know, there is uh, a, a series of arguments, empirical ones from empirical psychology, uh, on why perhaps religion has something to do with evolutionary needs. And there is uh, a series of things so there is evidence on religiosity effects on fitness, relevant outcomes. This is mating, interpersonal relationships, self enhancement status, offspring production, parenting, life expectancy, health, and mind perception. But I would like today to take another perspective that it is not to understand why it may have been adapted to have religion or not. But the perspective is how we can understand the adaptiveness of the individual differences in religiousness. So the question is, ah, that's a bit not so easy. We, yeah. So the question is, in fact, throughout centuries, perhaps thousands of years, and across societies, there always have been believers and non-believers. So that's even that has been pervasive across history, across societies, 
just uh, one or two examples. In uh, Greek ancient philosophy, you have already atheist philosophers. And uh, you have also some tribes, historically, that perhaps they have been uh, not really religious. So non-believers and believers have coexisted for, <laughs> for um, thousands of years, perhaps, or at least hundreds of years. So what is adapted in terms of individual differences? So if you think most, more as a personality psychologist who tries to understand um, why there may be, for instance, more agreeable people than mean people. Eh? So if we think in terms of individual differences in religiosity, what has been adaptive? First, perhaps to be believer. Second, perhaps it is adapted to be non-believer. Or perhaps it is adaptive to be in the middle and to not be strong believer, neither a strong atheist. Just one argument by, um, by uh, hypothesis here. For the first one, so let's say believers, it's better, it's more adaptive to, be, to have believers. You may have a simple argument that the two-thirds of the world population till today um, are believers or belong to uh, major four or five major religions. For the second um, hypothesis that perhaps it's better, it's, it has been or it is adaptive to be a non-believer, you may get the argument that uh, in the more developed countries, you have more and more non-believers. And if you uh, get the third idea that perhaps it's better or it's more adaptive to be in the middle, of course the argument is that radicalism is on the extremes, certainly um, intergroup, interreligious and intergroup conflict and violence is present uh, where uh, strong believers and radical believers are there, but also atheists. So I, you can see here three maps. Uh, the first represents the, the geographical map of the world, the main uh, world religions. The second is the um, uh, proportion of non-believers um, in green and uh, believers in red in the map, and in the third map you have, of course, uh, ex-Union, uh, Soviet Union uh, versus other countries, and you have the presence of uh, high religious discrimination, I think, or, yeah, high religious discrimination uh, in the world. But you may also have a fourth hypothesis that perhaps there is nothing about adaptiveness and uh, it is just a neutral variation. Or, and that's the last hypothesis, and I will more argue in favor of this one, is that it is adaptive to have both, to have both believers and non-believers, and even more strictly, it is adaptive to have individual variation uh, on religiosity. So how I would like to argue in favor of this hypothesis? First, to remind that there is strong connect strong. There is some connection between personality and religiousness. Um, it, there, is even, there are even several arguments in favor of the idea that religiosity, so being believer or being atheist, reflects, so in big five terms, is a characteristic adaptation of personality traits. And we know that these personality traits are mainly agreeableness and conscientiousness. So if this is the case, and this is the case, uh, this means that um, uh, religiosity, high religiosity, denotes personal and social stability. And you have similar findings with, of course, the links, uh, regarding the links between religiosity and low impulsivity, um, the need to belong also, but also with some uh, uh, need for distinctiveness, and this may uh, come back to the previous talk, uh, of course. And also you have now research clearly showing that there is um, religiosity uh, relates to uh, holistic thinking style, whether, on the contrary, atheism reflects analytic thinking style and uh, it is not really related positively or negatively with um, um, agreeableness or conscientiousness, but clearly relates positively with high openness to experience. And there is now, uh, since 15 years, pretty good evidence showing that there are genetic influences, of course, on personality traits, but in parallel on religiosity too, and till now uh, three years, there are at least three studies uh, in both uh, US and Europe showing that uh, you may have common genetic influences 
on personality traits, agreeableness, conscientiousness, or other ones, and religiosity, and um, it may be that it is, uh, the origin is really common. And if you are more interested and have a broader perspective on what is uh, the uh, state of the art on the issue, yeah, here I present an edited volume that just came out last year, Personality and Social Psychology of Religion. But before going too quickly, uh, too far, and saying religiosity is uh, an adaptation of personality traits just to make things a bit more complex. So the idea is that, of course, it's an adaptation of personality traits and related values, of course, and this kind of individual differences. But we need to integrate a bit the interaction with the environment, and this environment is particularly the family environment and the socialization. So the idea is that, of course, if you are agreeable and conscientious and you grow up in a religious family, then you end up religious, so you will stay religious or you will become again religious, this kind of stuff. But if, of course, you are agreeable and conscientious and you grow on a secular or an uh, atheist family, in principle there, are no, there is no much reason to be religious, but you will uh, find alternative ways to express your personality tendencies, for instance, by uh, becoming secular uh, humanitarian. And that make uh, this idea may explain why uh, in a recent uh, JPSP paper by Gebauer, Gosling and others, they found that, of course, the links between personality traits and religiosity are clearer in religious countries, but they are much weaker in non-religious countries. So, what is the, why the variation in personality may be adaptive? What are the two or three major theories today? Um, the idea is that perhaps um, what it is adaptive is not to be only agreeable or only not agreeable, but the individual variation on personality traits. And you have the three most uh, cited and uh, uh, most plausible theories, frequency dependence, flictiating optimum, contingency on other traits. And all these th three theories have as common assumption, implicit assumption, that uh, the advantages of one level, for instance, being high in agreeableness, are at the same time disadvantages of the other pole, for instance, being low in agreeableness, and the opposite. So this means that the benefits of the high pole are the costs of the other pole, and vice versa. Of course, the arguments uh, in favor of this idea that there is evolutionary uh, uh, understanding of individual differences comes more, uh, more from history than today. Also, to specify that I'm not an evolutionary psychologist, so I have no expertise at all on this, so it's uh, a kind of freedom I uh, allow myself to take uh, comparatively to my uh, uh, common work that it is more strictly personality and social psychology of religion, but okay, I think it's nice to uh, get some ideas and develop some hypotheses why there may be so pervasive variation between believers and atheists across the world and for centuries. So, let's take the example of uh, frequency, not example, frequency dependence, just to remind what it is. The idea is that the advantages of, do, uh, so uh, the, the emphasis is on the advantages of doing what others are not doing. So there is no single idea level, but what it is ideal is the balance between, uh, for instance, high and low agreeable people across time. Take the flictiating optimum hypothesis. So here, the idea is that there are ideal levels, but this depends on the environment. So this changes as a function of time and as a function of place. So uh, the mean levels that, for instance, again, agreeableness mean level by country at this historical moment depend on the conditions of a given time and a given place. And the third theory, contingency on other traits. The idea is that um, here you don't need the intervention of the environment to explain things. The idea is that one personality trait becomes more important as a function of the co-presence of other traits. And so there is interdependence between traits. Um, let's take... Yeah, I am sorry, but it's not the best uh, uh, machine to go ahead. Yeah? So I have made already 10 clicks 
to go further. <laughs> And it doesn't work. OK, it's the 13, so the bad one, it works. OK, so uh, take the example of agreeableness. That denotes, of course, uh, cooperation and not following. So the high agreeable people, of course, they have benefits. They gain from cooperation and coalitions, mutual help, non aggression, at least. And, but there are some costs, of it, of course, to be agreeable because you may be exploited by the bad people, that you may be a victim of uh, cheaters. But take the low agreeable people, they have also benefits, of course. They have benefits by exploiting others, and that's real ones, it's not a joke. Eh? Uh, and there are costs. Of course, no cooperation, no coalitions, and some exclusion if you don't follow the social norms. Take conscientiousness, um, that denotes, of course, industriousness and orderliness. So the high, the high people who are high in conscientiousness have, of course, benefits, uh, material gains, improved use of resources, and reduced risks, health, and success, uh, job, in job, uh, sometimes in marriage, and this kind of stuff. But there are some costs, of course. For instance, rigidity, difficulty to adapt in social changes. Take people who are low in conscientiousness, they have benefits, they have much time, much energy to do many other things instead of following your course or first bachelor and uh, get bored. But there are costs, of course. Um, no industriousness, no strong performances in many tasks and in many uh, objectives. And think a bit of thinking style. There are benefits of uh, holistic style. For instance, uh, there is now much serious research showing that Magical thinking has a heuristic value. Uh, Overprotection of um, holistic thinking. The capacity of getting the big picture and withdrawing from very narrow focus to a very uh, small point. And of course, uh, the advantages of collectivistic uh, uh, groups and societies. Take the analytic thinking. Of course, many advantages in terms of rationality, progress, and individual autonomy. Um, then let's apply, for instance, the frequency dependence theory in agreeableness. The idea is that in society where you have many people, too many people who are agreeable, some few people in the beginning eh, who will, of course, help, have a benefit to be mean in agreeableness. And then it will, they will gain resources, status by exploiting others. So they will progressively start to be very attractive and their number will increase and there will be more and more mean people, and at the end you will have too many bad people in, <laughs> in the society. So that's again a problem, and then the idea of this theory is that uh, it starts again, and then the nice people, the agreeable people, start to be again attractive, and uh, they are more and more uh, like them, and then you have a great, greater fitness of high agreeableness. Then take conscientiousness. Ah, two consensus, rigidity that goes too far, you see. So, consensusness, of course, uh, th then as an example to apply the other theory, uh, flictuating optimum, the idea is that in time and places where uh, being organized and being hardworking pays off in terms of gaining resources and uh, reproduction to survive and to reproduce, then you have, of course, higher uh, chance. Uh, for higher mean levels of conscientiousness. But if the two, so uh, being organized and hard worker, is not, necessarily, is, is not necessary for survival and reproduction, then you don't need too many conscientious people. Then conscientiousness, mean level of conscientiousness in this group, in this society, decreases. Let's apply this thinking in religiosity. So the idea is that we perhaps need both believers and non-believers, and that's what it is adaptive. But let's start, what may be the benefits of being a believer? Personal stability, social compliance, then it depends on your ideology, but some people tend to consider that as a benefit, and a kind of moral self-transcendence in terms, in particular, of self-control and in-group prosociality. But also there are costs 
of being religious. There may be rigidity in ideas, and then you have, of course, dogmatism. And dogmatism is not, in strong uh, terms, is associated with fundamentalism, but in soft terms, for instance, high need for closure is associated with mere religiosity. Eh? And then you may have rigidity in values, moralism, and you may have some rigidity in group identification, so uh, strong intergroup uh, conflict, and then uh, prejudice and uh, intergroup interreligious and intergroup violence. But take now the non-believers. Also, there are benefits of being non-believer. Autonomy, creativity, capacity to contest the social order and the social norms, and to use uh, more abstract terms that comes from theory on Big Five, of course, the capacity for plasticity. But there are also costs to be atheist. Some kind of materialism, too much materialism in society, individualism, a kind of temporary social disorder, at least temporary, something like that, and to some extent, lower subjective well-being. Oh goodness. Um, yeah. So let's apply the theory of uh, frequency dependence on variation in religiousness. The idea here is that in when you have very religious countries where many people are religious and agreeable and consensus, so low in impulsiveness, with high propensity for holistic thinking, that's perhaps too much. Uh, and then uh, the few religious, uh, non-religious people, uh, few atheists, may start to gain benefits to be attractive, because they may start to gain resources, advantages, status, through individualism, values liberalism, social contest and uh, social change. And then this will increase the fitness of uh, non-believers. But at the end, you will have a two atheist or a two secular society, something like that. Then few people who may be, again, religious or spiritual, something like that, start to gain uh, through cooperation and more strict moral norms in the face of uncertainty and uh, uh, angle of uh, rel relativism in morality. An example, more, a more recent one, take the end of the 19th century and the 20th century. What happened? Okay, we had, a, of course, in the West, the Christian predominance, and we have even clearly an anti modernism eh, at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. So we ca may imagine, we may speculate at least, that then as a reaction you had in the 60s, since the 60s, this kind of reaction that uh, promoted uh, moral liberalization and in particular in sexuality, individualistic values, social contest, uh, May 68, and of course, uh, secularization, important secularization. Then as a counter reaction of that, uh, from the late 90s, so it was a trend if you take European uh, value survey or world value survey, apparently it was a trend before 9-11, this return. So it is not uh, strictly related to 9-11. Uh, you have a kind of a coming back of traditional uh, religious, uh, sorry, traditional values, in particular family-related values. You have increase of ethnic and national identities. And in parallel, or as a consequence of that, you have an increase of spirituality as a kind of protesting against materialism, excessive individualism, and a kind of social anomia, to use uh, Durkheim's uh, um, term, at least in the West. And in parallel, you have also increase of fundamentalism, not only uh, uh, in places uh, that is not the West, but also in the West. For instance, you have uh, uh, several uh, conversions to Islam. Take the second theory, fluctuating optimum, how we can understand things here. 
the idea is that religiosity may be more adaptive, may be more useful in dysfunctional societies, and the atheism may be, and in fact is, and that's a lot of empirical data now in the last years, atheism is perhaps more useful, more, um, uh, more adaptive in successful societies, and the indirect evidence in favor of this idea comes from um, uh, nice international data showing that um, mean level of religiosity by country in, is higher in societies that are dysfunctional in terms of lower democracy, lower social security, lower income uh, equality, higher uh, rate of uh, diseases, higher rate of uh, uh, death, uh, mortality and uh, suicide, and also higher poverty and higher unemployment. Now, how we can understand the uh, occurrence of traits? Here, I'm a bit less sure, but okay, let's uh, tentatively first to remind something that the personality uh, predispositions of religiosity is not independently agreeableness and or conscientiousness, it's the coexistence of the two. So what may be adaptive for high religiousness is the profile, not the unique um, uh, presence of each of uh, the two. Then you may understand now many um, uh, results that come from uh, uh, psychological research on religion that altruism, religious altruism, is not ecumenical, uh, tolerant, uh, universal, but it is conditional, it is in group oriented, it is um, um, limited even, and minimal even size. You may understand compassionate conservatism, uh, but also the fact that. If you remember, there was a nice study by uh, Laurent Begg showing that agreeableness and conscientiousness also predict submission to Milgram-like uh, experiments. So they are also factors of uh, social conformity and perhaps even uh, compliance and submissiveness. So the idea here is that, that it is an adaptive profile, rather adaptive uh, unique traits that may be adaptive. And you may even go further by thinking that if you have a, a religiousness with only high agreeableness, it's a bit uh, not so helpful for religion because then it becomes too charismatic or um, too oriented to social humanitarianism and then you lose, in terms of adaptiveness or psychological uh, mechanism, you lose at least all the gains you gain through religious rituals, for instance. And take the risks if you have a religiousness that it is only based on conscientiousness, of course, this may facilitate sectarian versions, fundamentalist versions of religion, or two moralistic uh, religions. An example in favor of this idea may be that the country's mean level of religiosity is high in if collectivism is high, and it is low if collectivism is low. And in parallel, there are studies now showing that uh, uh, the mean level, so the country's mean level of agreeableness and conscientiousness correlates with the mean, with the country's mean level of religiosity. And this is a study, uh, a world study, but also the same results if you take the 50 states of the uh, US. So, to conclude and discuss a bit, Perhaps it's not the priority, or it's not the only question, or perhaps it's not the main question uh, why, whether the region has been adaptive or not. But perhaps a more intriguing question is why there has been so pervasive variation across history in religiousness with believers and non-believers always here. And a next question, subsequent to the first, why there have been changes, or how we can explain the change the changes in the mean level of religiosity across times and places. Of course, the question, as I mentioned earlier, is a bit more complex because we have to include in this model the interaction with the family environment that may facilitate or not religious socialization or may facilitate or not atheism. Of course, there are limitations of these um, theoretical, I would say, uh, these theoretical uh, considerations. Of course, it's not a strict evolutionary framework here, and uh, probably it's if there is a kind of selection, it's uh, 
uh, much more cultural than natural. And there is still ongoing question whether uh, debate whether religion really uh, responds or has to do with strict evolutionary motives or its motives more general that are not strictly evolutionary ones. And of course, we need more old evidence than the more recent and more modern examples I gave. And also, of course, if you have noticed, of course, I <laughs> uh, selected examples that confirm the idea, but of course, it would be uh, much more complicated to find examples that infirm the, the hypothesis. But don't forget there is uh, a strong evidence of genetic influences on high versus low religiosity. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, this evidence, of course, these genetic influences are lower in size than for personality, but they are still there. Then there may be further questions that may be interested to think in terms of uh, this adaptive function of individual variation in religiosity. And this is, um, again, it doesn't work. And then we may, okay, up, too far. No, somebody else going up. Yeah. So modern spirituality. So how we can understand in these terms modern spirituality emerging and being more and more popular in the West at least? It may be a kind of substitute of religiosity in an atheist or a secular environment. And in fact, in terms of personality predispositions, you have agreeableness and consensusness, like all religion. But in addition, you have a high openness to experience. So it may be that this modern spirituality, in a way, has the same adaptive functions than the, uh, uh, like the old uh, style religiosity. And um, interestingly, across societies, the variation on mean religiosity is much higher than the vari variation in personality traits. So this could mean that, could imply that it's much more clear that there may be more advantages to have a society with many agreeable people than many mean people, but it is uh, much less evident what it is the advantage to have either many believers or many atheists, and perhaps the idea is that the, 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 the more adaptive is to have variation between, uh, strong variation between the, the two. And you may also apply this kind of thinking on individual changes, sorry, on changes on individual uh, uh, level of religiousness. Uh, just two or th three or four examples. Uh, we know now from research on developmental uh, changes on personality that uh, there are some ones, for instance, in adolescence, agreeableness and consciousness decreases, then openness to experience increases. And we have the same with religiosity. And take uh, f uh, first adulthood, after 25, 30 years old, you have the opposite pattern. Uh, agreeableness, consciousness increase, openness to experience decrease, and the religiosity comes back or increase again. You may make a parallelism between the impact of negative life events and positive life experience in changes on individual religiousness across life and the same kind of influence or environmental influences on changes on mean level of religiosity across countries or across um, uh, times. Also, just a, a small stuff, uh, some research shows that at least in the West, uh, religiosity becomes lower or at least religious practice becomes lower during summer. So perhaps people may have many other things to do uh, uh, than going to, uh, to pray. And also the fact that the religiosity, for instance, increased among second generation immigrants. So the simple idea here is that perhaps there may be some adaptiveness on um, changes of the religiosity level also within individuals. So to uh, conclude, I would just uh, 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 summarize the main idea that uh, rather than if we are believers, seeing others around us and say how it is possible that other people uh, don't believe and vice versa, if you are atheist and you are upset that there are so many rational believers around you, what I could say, perhaps there is some reason to be a bit more cool that it's good for uh, human life and societies uh, functioning that we have both uh, believers and non-believers. Thanks a lot for your attention.
I'm going to address a question today um, uh, which we've been working on in recent years. Is a willingness to fight and die for group, um, group values and group causes something that we can attribute to religious motivations? Um, there are many who would say instantly, yes, of course, it's obvious. Uh, some examples here on this um, slide. Um, but as Pascal said this morning, um, one could equally argue that no, one ca cannot attribute uh, willingness to fight and die for group causes to religion or any kind of intergroup conflict to religion. Of course, to make any kind of progress with this kind of question, we need to be clear what we are, well, what we mean by religion to start with. And this is not a straightforward matter. People have debated this for a long time. I've got an example on the next slide of um, just how old, how far back these debates go. These are 19th century scholars. Um, Edward Tyler, of course, famously argued that religion was an effort to make sense of puzzling observations and experiences in the absence of a sort of fuller scientific understanding of the world. Uh, Freud argued that religion um, uh, really was an expression of repressed feelings, primarily of guilt. Uh, Durkheim, that religion was an effort to make sense, I guess, or to con conceptualize in a highly coded fashion um, the nature of the social order in which you happen to have been born and raised. Marx, of course, famously argued that religion was an instrument of class oppression uh, being used to legitimate increasingly unpleasant forms of economic exploitation and political domination. Now, all of these undoubtedly brilliant scholars suffered, I think, from a common problem apart from the obvious facial hair problem, which we don't know if that's relevant here. Um, namely, that in trying to define religion, they wanted to try and boil the phenomenon down to a single core feature or functional process. Um, but as Pascal pointed out earlier, uh, religion is not a natural kind, uh, nor is it a kind of monolithic entity. And I think one of the um, most intriguing uh, outcomes of recent scientific research on religion is the realization that religion is really needs to be broken up into its myriad component features, each of which may be underpinned by quite different psychological mechanisms um, uh, with different evolutionary histories associated with them. So here is an example of the approach to uh, religion that fractionates the phenomenon, breaks it up into its component elements. Uh, so Pascal talked a little earlier about supernatural agency. Um, we could talk about the feature that, uh, of um, religious uh, thinking and behavior that we find all around the world, that some part of the person lives on after the physical body expires, so the idea of life after death. Creation, the idea that um, uh, features of the natural world or of the cosmos are that way because some intelligent agent designed them that way. Portents, the idea that, that sort of seemingly random events in the world are actually um, communicating something important. Rituals, the idea that performing a particular action sequence um, that is by definition causally opaque, that if we had a rational physical causal explanation for the sequence, it wouldn't be a ritual anymore, that performing those kinds of things can have palpable material effects in the world. Um, exegesis, the idea that those causally opaque actions uh, have meanings, uh, are symbolically motivated. Belief resilience, the idea that certain beliefs are sort of beyond uh, question, that they're sort of uh, resistant to argument-based or evidence-based rebuttal, and ASC or altered states of consciousness. Uh, these are just examples of the kinds of components of religious thinking and behavior um, that we might imagine as uh, universally recurrent in human societies and, and, and in human history and prehistory, um, but which, when we th start to think about any one of them, uh, are underpinned by quite different psychological causes and have different evolutionary histories. Now, what I'd like to do is to focus on just one component of this uh, fractionated repertoire, um, if I can get this thing to advance. It seems like the... Uh, are you able to advance it at the back? Ah, here we go. So I'd like to focus on rituals. And uh, let, me let me forward this. Here we go. Um, the question that 
we're interested in is how performing rituals in groups uh, can bond those groups together and in um, circumstances when those highly cohesive groups perceive themselves to be under threat from out groups can lead to extreme behavior, for instance, willingness to fight and die for the group. Uh, I have students uh, all around the world at the moment conducting, uh, uh, participating in extreme rituals of various kinds. Especially, it seems that it, uh, emotionally intense rituals, particularly those involving fear and pain, uh, are particularly effective at bonding groups together. And these are the kinds of groups which, when threatened, uh, represent, uh, constitute formidable adversaries. Um, now, at the core of our understanding of group bonding is uh, a construct known as identity fusion, which is essentially a visceral sense of oneness with the group. All of us have two kinds of identities. We have personal identities, that's to say qualities that make us distinctive as individuals, and we have group identities, identities that align us with groups. And most people, most of the time, see their personal and social identities as somewhat distinct and separate. Now, one of the kind of really interesting findings of social identity theory is that um, when people identify with groups, it's essentially a depersonalizing experience. It's as if when the group becomes salient, the personal self becomes less so. It's as if we lose ourselves in the group. So there's a kind of hydraulic relationship between personal and group identity. The more that personal identity is salient, the less accessible are thoughts about the group and vice versa. With identity fusion, it's a very different matter. It seems as if the personal and social identity become fused. There's a kind of union between the two, so that when uh, the group self is salient, so too is the personal self, and vice versa. This is what we call identity fusion. It involves a seemingly porous boundary between the personal self and the group self, producing a feeling of oneness, essentially, and a very strong relational ties to other members of the group. Measures of fusion uh, began with a sort of pictorial measure where people were uh, presented with a series of uh, um, depictions of self and group, self being a small circle, group being a large circle, and were invited to say which of these representations of the relationship between the small and the large circle best characterizes uh, their relationship with the group. And we would say that the person who chooses that last one there with the arrow over it, where the self is fully encompassed by the group, we would say would be fused with that group. A couple of years later, uh, emerged a, a series of verbal measures of fusion, uh, measures like uh, uh, statements like, I am one with my country, I feel immersed in my country, my country is me. Uh, these sorts of states, people were invited to endorse those on a Likert scale, and the higher the endorsement, the stronger the level of fusion. We find it useful to distinguish two kinds of fusion. Local fusion, uh, where essentially um, people are uh, fused with a, a small group of uh, relational ties, essentially, where people know other members of the small group personally, and extended fusion, where people are fusing with a large group category, like a, a nation or a, a religion or an ethnic group. But what's interesting is that in both local and extended fusion, the language of family is pervasive. Um, just to illustrate the, the nature of the sort of familial character of um, bonds based on fusion, uh, let me describe briefly a study that we did in 2013 in the immediate aftermath of the Boston Marathon bombings. Um, uh, what we did is we took a sample of Bostonians and measured fusion with America. We measured uh, psychological kinship with their fellow Americans based on uh, statements like members of my country are like family to me, I see other members of my country as brothers and sisters, statements like that. And we uh, recorded self-reported support behaviors. So uh, did people donate m uh, money to help survivors? Did they donate blood um, for the victim? Did they pray for victims, etc.? And what we found was that the relationship between fusion with America and actions to support bombing victims uh, was fully mediated by uh, endorsement of those kinds of statements of psychological kinship with Americans. Now, let's uh, 
talk you through how we've been applying these ideas to intergroup conflict, in particular the role of dysphoric experience and particularly intense Im emotionally intense rituals, the role that that plays in building strong social cohesion in groups and ultimately explaining willingness to fight and die for groups. Our starting point is the idea that dysphoric experiences, um, that's to say experiences that are frightening and painful and negative, ne negatively stressful in those ways, tend to be uh, remembered more enduringly and more vividly than other kinds of experiences. Um, to the extent that people reflect on those uh, enduringly, you know, those very highly memorable and vivid experiences, uh, they, they come to develop a, a sort of self-narrative, a story about how those things go into shaping uh, the personal self. Uh, to the extent that those things are ritualized, people reflect more on them, and we have a, qu a growing body of empirical evidence that this is the case. Now, the central idea is that when people feel that they share those very self-defining experiences with other members of their group, this produces fusion. It breaks down, essentially, the boundary between the personal self and the group self. Um, and when groups that are fused in that way perceive outgroups to be uh, plausible, imminent, and uh, serious threats to their well-being as a group, they respond uh, in, uh, the in ways that we might regard as extreme behavior. That's to say the willingness to fight and die for the group response. Um, so to talk you through some of our research on this topic, one of our earlier studies uh, was in 2011 uh, when, as you all remember, the Arab Spring, uh, Libya was under, uh, uh, in the throes of a revolution for most of that year. And we conducted a study of 179 uh, revolutionaries in Misrata, a city that had been under siege for many months, um, uh, facing a, a appalling loss of life. Um, and we uh, asked, first of all, we measured uh, levels of fusion between revolutionaries and uh, various groups of which they were members. I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Um, and uh, it's important to, to, to say also that our sample, uh, although it was composed entirely of revolutionaries who fought within particular uh, battalions, um, our sample was composed half of those who faced frontline combat and half those who provided logistical support to the frontline fighters. So we used the pictorial fusion scale to measure fusion with the following target groups. Family, closest friends in your uh, katiba just means your battalion. Uh, people you never met from other battalions who fought in the revolution. Uh, and pro-revolutionary men in Libya who didn't fight in the revolution. And here's what we found. Almost ceiling levels of fusion with family with your friends in the battalion, and with uh, fighters from other battalions you'd never met, so extended fusion in that case. Um, but virtually no fusion at all with people who are on your side ideologically but hadn't faced the horrors of frontline combat. Now, among other things, of course, that meant uh, that they hadn't shared the dysphoric experiences that you'd gone through, the thing that we consider likely to be salient, but of course there could be other explanations for that. Now, given these very high levels of fusion with the the first three target groups, we wanted to figure out whether there was any difference between fighters and providers of logistical support. So we asked people a forced choice question. We said, okay, we get that you're fused with your family, we get that you're fused with your closest friends in the battalion, and with members of other battalions you've never met. But if you had to choose one group, which would it be? And here we find an interesting difference between fighters and providers of logistical support. Fighters who faced the worst dysphoric experiences of frontline combat, seeing their comrades killed in their arms and, and all the horrors and, blood, and, and bloodshed of, of the revolution, uh, were more likely to choose their fellow fighters uh, over family than were those who supported them in the battalion. Now, it's an interesting finding. It's not conclusive, though, about because the causal arrows could have gone in any number of directions here. Uh, we'd like to think that it's the shared dysphoria that has driven these exceptionally high levels of fusion among fellow fighters, but it could have been the other way around. Maybe uh, fusion was what drove them to the front lines in the first place. We don't think so for various reasons, but to explore this problem, we've developed a series of other studies since. For example, a study of fusion among veterans of uh, American veterans of the uh, conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Here, individuals had no control over their deployment, so any differences in fusion levels couldn't, you know, that were correlated with uh, exposure to frontline combat 
uh, couldn't be explained in terms of uh, prior fusion. Um, in this sample, uh, we created a combat experience questionnaire, basically a list of the most common uh, dysphoric experiences that um, the military face in combat. Um, and then we uh, looked at uh, how uh, intense their sort of combat experience was and found that that did indeed correlate not only with unit fusion, local fusion, that's to say, but also with fusion with uh, vets uh, at large, so extended fusion with fellow military who served in those countries. Exploring this a bit more deeply, we, con uh, we conducted a study with Vietnam veterans uh, where we were looking really at how uh, personally salient experiences of combat were and how that related to um, shared dysphoric experience and fusion. And here what we found is that the more that people had reflected on the experience of frontline combat, the more fused they were. Okay. Now, all of these studies, and there are quite a lot more uh, ongoing at the moment, um, prompts various questions about, you know, what the evolutionary kind of uh, history is that l gives rise to uh, this phenomenon of fusion with the group and its relationship to shared dysphoric experience. One possible uh, way of understanding this is via group selection, that if... Um, uh, individuals lived in very harsh environments, let's say ones characterized by shared dysphoric experience, uh, groups that were fused to one another and therefore willing to stand by each other in the face of, of danger uh, would have uh, fared better than non-fused groups. But for group selection arguments like that to work, they also must work at the individual level, right? So uh, fused individuals would have to uh, do better than non-fused individuals. So we'd need to work out a, 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 a sort of mathematical model that would uh, uh, allow this to, to work. Um, another possibility is kin selection. That is to say, if the group comprises uh, people who are closely related to you genetically, then self-sacrifice might actually be the best way of passing on your genes. Um, but that would require a very good mechanism for recognizing who your kin are. One possibility is that those who have suffered the trials and tribulations of life together with you are most likely to be your uh, uh, members of your kin group. Another is that they look like you or smell like you or have other phenotypic traits that uh, lead you to believe um, reliably that those are your uh, kin. Um, and it's kind of interesting that military groups appear to hijack both of those uh, prospective mechanisms. For example, uh, they create a sense of shared dysphoric experience by putting uh, their uh, participants through hazing experiences, uh, particularly cruel initiatory uh, ordeals, things like that, and of course battlefield experience. But they also seem to um, uh, co-opt uh, some kind of uh, phenotypic uh, s matching kind of mechanism by having people all have the same haircut, wear the same uniforms, that kind of thing. So we conducted a study to investigate some of these issues using a large sample of twins, 256 of them, uh, roughly half of which were identical, the other half fraternal. Um, and our questions really were, first, are monozygotic twins more strongly fused with their twin as compared with dizygotic twins? And secondly, does shared dysphoric experience contribute to fusion with your twin? Um, and actually, we found evidence for both of these hypotheses, that um, biological similarity as measured by zygosity uh, was indeed correlated with fusion with one's twin. Um, but so too, independently of this, was shared dysphoric experience. Um, interestingly, shared dysphoria does not produce identification with one's twin in, in the same way. So the sort of fusion pathway to fusion seems to be different from the pathway to identification there, which is an interesting aspect. Um, building on this study, we uh, did a sort of priming study uh, on MTurk, where we uh, had a couple of hundred participants, uh, and we assigned them uh, to three uh, separate conditions. One was uh, where we were essentially priming uh, self-defining experiences, and then saying, okay, imagine you met somebody uh, you'd never met before, but who'd been through that exact same experience as you, and then measured fusion with that imaginary person. We did the same where we primed genetic traits, had people write about things that get tra genetically transmitted, and then said, right, now imagine meeting a brother or sister you didn't even know existed um, for the first time, and then measured fusion with them. And then we had a control condition. And uh, this was the fusion measure that we used, uh, two circles of equal size, you being one, and the uh, hypothetical stranger 
the other one, and fusion levels, interestingly, were much were highest of all in the dysphoric uh, shared ex dysphoric experience um, um, condition. Uh, genes next, and then of course the control was the lowest. Okay, I'm going to end with br briefly some uh, potential implications of all of this. First of all, can this kind of research that we're doing help us to defuse uh, combatants in armed conflicts, to de-radicalize, for, for instance, uh, uh, Islamist fighters? Um, what mechanisms would be needed to do this? Could we um, disrupt or undermine people's uh, beliefs in the veracity of their autobiographical memories, the self-shaping experiences that seem to be so important for fusion with a group? Could we weaken or undermine people's sense of the sharedness of their unique self-defining experiences with other group members? These are the sorts of approaches that have never been considered from a policy perspective, and we think it's kind of, uh, as, as the research grows on this topic, we think there is this potential. Um, could we, conversely, take fusion as a beneficial thing that we can harness for the public good in various ways? Um, Many societies, Libya was an incredibly uh, striking example from my experience of visiting it in the, in the, towards the end of the revolution. Uh, terrible mayhem, terrible destruction, but massively high levels of fusion that were not harnessed to rebuild that country. And this is so commonly the case in countries like that, torn apart by conflict. Could we do more to harness fusion positively? Could we use it to uh, address global problems like uh, extreme poverty in the world, for example, through more effective forms of global taxation. Um, anyway, there, there are all kinds of possibilities. Uh, I'm going to end with that uh, and, and with thanks to the many collaborators and, and students and postdocs who've worked with me on some of the studies that I've described. Thank you very much. I was wondering, uh, maybe related to the last talk, um, what you think about in terms, if we think in terms of fusion, um, would it be um, the case that we need to think about um, larger groups than um, the one that has been described in order to um, maybe overcome uh, the problems that have emerged uh, regarding with uh, extremist visions of religion? Um, so, for example, the, the, uh, the ecological problems might allow us to form a larger view of humanity um, instead of uh, splitting people in groups. And this might help us to, to create a, a larger uh, vision and, and fusion. What, what, what do you think about Well, well one thing to, s to say here is that we... Um, I mentioned the distinction between local fusion and extended fusion. And at present, we don't know a huge amount about uh, the different capacities of those two kinds of fusion to motivate uh, pro-group behavior. Um, a sort of working hypothesis is that local fusion is the only one that's really capable to dri of driving what we might call extreme behavior. That's to say, willingness to sacrifice self for group, to lay down one's life for the group. Um, and it's been argued uh, using lots of different kinds of studies that actually what motivates suicide bombers, what motivates um, uh, you know, the, the elite forces in conventional armies to um, lay down their lives for each other is not commitment to some higher abstract cause or to some very large scale group, but to their, their sort of um, brothers in arms essentially, their, their local group. So local fusion seems to be capable of, of doing that in a way, uh, this is at least, as I say, a working hypothesis, in a way that we wouldn't expect of extended fusion. Um, extended fusion may well uh, lead to endorsement of extreme behavior on the part of others. It may well lead to sympathy for suicide bombers and for all kinds of it. But I don't think it's, um, on current evidence, I don't think it's, it's likely to turn out to be a motivator of extreme behavior. Um, but extended fusion, do that doesn't make it it's sort of powerless to influence behavior. It may be that uh, it, it is precisely what you need to um, get people to make other kinds of uh, sacrifices for the group, not the ultimate sacrifice, but to pay, um, to, to give away more of their income, for example, to support uh, charitable work, perhaps, perhaps on a global scale. I mean, these are, these are possibilities. Um, but I think we need a lot more research on this topic to understand exactly what is possible. 
Would you like to react um, regarding these issues? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> So you don't want to react because you, you disagree with the, with the notion of fusion, or...? No, 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 no. It's just that uh, Harvey's done um, extensive work on this and has said more or less um, all there is to say given the you know, present state of evidence. So we anticipate you know, more research and more results. But it, it's, uh, I, I must say that, as you notice, the theoretical and the empirical studies, uh, the, the theoretical models and the empirical findings, that's all very recent. Okay, this is not a, uh, uh, there's no tradition of working on this, so mm. he needs a grant, another one, <laughs> <laughs> and more research. So. No, I can't say anything else. Um, yeah, one, perhaps a small thing uh, to, to add, if um, I see the relation between uh, Harvey's presentation and your question, is that uh, the factors that were, uh, that appeared to be involved in the explanation of the phenomena, we could classify them as kind of uh, proximal causes, something like that. And then, but the, the other half <laughs> of the story, uh, that's not a criticism, and it's just to answer to the question of uh, uh, Arnaud, is that uh, then wh where, what are the distal causes and what may be the interaction of the two? So why some people uh, go to uh, passe à l'acte, uh, so then realize really sacrificial, um, self-sacrificial <laughs> uh, behavior uh, and others not, that's okay, that's a kind of more individual level analysis, but then we come back always with the internal questions about uh, social inequality, uh, feeling of humiliations, uh, discrimination and this kind of stuff. And that's perhaps the other half of the, of the picture. Of, uh, so yeah. Well, certainly the, one of the things that your work which I absolutely love, um, makes me think about is the, the notion of the in-group and the fact that with our multiple identities, in-group becomes a sort of fluid uh, phenomenon. So I may be an in-group in terms of ethnicity, but not in terms of uh, other aspects of my identity, culture, gender, et cetera. And as even within the same geographic or national context, as the different aspects of my identity become salient, I shift in and out of what my in-group is, and I wonder about what that means in terms of fusion and how fusion gets shifted as certain identities become more or less salient for people. Uh, so you know, it, I think, is one of the, the interesting questions for me about especially fundamentalism, but certainly in the work that I do about uh, pro-social behavior, if you shift people's thinking about who their in-group is, you shift their behaviors about how they give yeah. uh, and who, to whom they give. So it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, thank you. May I respond to that last one? For, for sure. I mean, just a very brief response. Thank you for that. I'm, I, one thing I didn't mention is that, you know, among the different kinds of fusions that we think exist out there, there's a, a distinction to be made between what we call trait fusion, which is a pretty robust and stable uh, state of group alignment that lasts often a lifetime vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular group. And I think you gave uh, examples of that, actually, in, or at least some of the language sounded very fusion-y to me. Um, but there's also what we call s state fusion, and but what we mean by that is you can actually prime people with things like uh, very self-defining experiences and how shared those things are with other group members, and suddenly they feel more fused. Um, but it doesn't last very long because it's just a in the moment, you know. And there are lots of things that we see in politics, in sport, in public life that are sort of um, really good at, at sort of uh, cranking up the sense of fusion with the group, but only temporarily. And once those stimuli have gone, it sort of sinks back to its sort of more stable level. Um, but uh, and maybe also add that, you know, whilst it's possible to wear many different hats and have many different group identities, um, you know, identify, you can identify with lots and lots of different groups, but there seems to be quite a low uh, limit set on how many groups you can really fuse with. You know, you can maybe fuse with your church and fuse with your family, but if it's now starting to compete if you get too fused with your football team, you know, and it's, it's beyond that, it's getting hard. Um, so. Uh, fusion seems to have a limit there that identification doesn't. But I think I'm probably suffering from the curse of the last speaker in getting much more than my fair share of attention here, and, and maybe the audience have other questions for other speakers, but yeah. Okay, so yes. Uh, the uh, microphone is coming, please. 
Thank you. My name is Dr. George Varvatsoulias, and I would like to, to address a very general question to everyone in the panel. Whether the evolutionary understandings, the modern evolutionary understandings we've got about religion are byproducts of the 18th century uh, from the humanist point of view, as we know it from agnosticism and atheism. I'm not sure I understood the question. Oh, um, can you maybe rephrase your question? During the 18th century, there has been a revolution on ideas of agnosticism and atheism in every facet of social aspects and problems of society. Many of these aspects of social society, they had to do with the evolution, understanding, and of origins of man. If we remember the writings of Montesquieu and Voltaire. And out of these ideas of new human, inverted or without inverted commas, understandings of the rise of humanity, there also have been uh, reason ideas of the evolution understanding of man, as we know it from Darwin and uh, later from Freudian perspectives of moral philosophy, etc. That's why I'm asking this question, whether you see any kind of connection between the rise of agnosticism and atheism in 18th century in relation to modern understandings, evolution understandings about inter interpreting religion. Um, right. I, I'm not sure the, um, it's possible to say that the, the um, increase or the, the conceptualization we have of a certain doubt or indifference to uh, religious statements is necessarily linked to philosophical um, developments like, you know, the idea of um, a naturalistic worldview and so on. Um, we know from all sorts of tribal societies that for each uh, kind of supernatural belief, there are people who think it's perfectly serious and people think that it's a complete joke. And we have this kind of diversity that um, uh, Dr. Soroglu was talking about in lots of places. So I'm not sure the... Um, the idea of um, th the possibility or the con conceptual possibility uh, that most of the religious claims that are prevalent in your society are complete uh, junk, th th that's not really something that requires a specific view of humanity as evolving or not evolving or being in nature or not in nature. It did happen that way in European history, very much so, um, but I think the variance is there. But since the variance is my colleague's specialty, I don't want to say too much about that because I'm more concerned about, you know, common, about the mean he's concerned with the, the variance, so he can talk more about that probably. Yeah, th thanks, but uh, I have to confess that the acoustics were not excellent, and although I share with the uh, person who asked the question the same Greek origin, <laughs> I was unable to get the details, so I will not uh, intervene for something I didn't understand the, the whole stuff, so it's better not to say something that it is not uh, intelligent <laughs> from my side. <laughs> yeah. I'll venture something unintelligent in response, which is I, I wasn't, I too wasn't quite sure what the question was, but I, I did wonder whether the question was, you know, has our conception of what, uh, how to approach the question of, of religion as a panel been shaped heavily by uh, 18th century ideas and is our evolutionary agenda somehow historically traceable to 18th century concerns. I, may, maybe that was the question, I'm not really sure. Uh, if it was the question, I'd say yes, but only trivially so, because I think the way that the evolution of religion was conceived in um, 18th and 19th centuries, and also in the early part of the 20th century, um, bears very little relationship, I think, to any of these sort of evolutionary uh, accounts that we've heard discussed today, which are based on um, uh, the modern synthesis, essentially, which is a very different, a very different conception of evolution. <laughs>
I won't say any more because I'm not even sure I'm answering the question, but um, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it looks like um, a big question. I'm not sure that we, we can really answer it here today. Um, yeah, another question here. Uh, hi, <coughs> uh, thanks for the very interesting presentations. And I have a question for uh, Professor Boyer. Uh, so when you said that uh, religion as a concept is not uh, very useful for uh, for our uh, investigation, I was wondering, uh, I mean, just because it doesn't address the, these fundamental cognitive uh, processes such as theory of mind, etc., does it necessarily mean that it's not pragma of pragmatical use or uh, can be used in our uh, investigation? Because the same thing could be said about, for example, politics and political orientation, and uh, this is certainly useful in, uh, in, in yeah. the, for and worthy of psychological investigation. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could elaborate. Oh, right. Um, I'm not quite sure I would agree with the point about polit politics being a useful category either. But I in any case, yeah, I mean, the, the, the only reason for having this kind of analytical categories is the kind of uh, explanatory work they can do. So, um, to the extent that you're a gardener or landscape designer, or if you're a prey trying to escape from a predator, the concept of tree is very useful. And I'm sure some snakes and some cheetahs have a concept of tree, because it's a part of the environment that's different from other things. Um, but if you're a biologist trying to explain how they reproduce, how they grow, what, how they're dependent on seasons and stuff like that, it's of not, no great use. Okay, so everything you say about ferns will be true of a whole class of trees. Everything you say about oaks will be true of tulips, more or less. So, um, for religion, again, it's, the, it's a purely pragmatic thing. Um, if you say, I'm interested in the evolutionary, in the um, influence of um, human evolution and human evolved psychology on religion, then I think disaster ensues, because you're talking about something extremely special that we know in large-scale societies, and you're saying, and only happened in those societies in the last sort of 5,000 years, and you say, how do, um, how was that part of the evolution of modern um, humankind in the last sort of million years or so? And that's an example of where it goes really wrong. Um, in the same way, um, if you say, what's the role of religion in, you know, everyday life, you have all sorts of varieties that will be um, ignored if you, if, you, if you stick with this term. So that, for example, the sort of, the, the, the clear link between some forms of shamanism and some forms of, you know, wise people, uh, herbalists, or, you know, people who help you or stuff like that, diviners, will be missed because they're huddled together with the, with the priests in the religious category. So I think you know, it's really a, a pragmatic question. But if you're doing evolutionary psychology, I think it's a bad category most of the time. If you're doing politics, yeah, I mean, it can work. Yeah. Uh, it, it, but it can work only if you're not too interested in the ultimate causal uh, psychological mechanisms. That's all. And anyway, since there are grants for re research on religion, positions in the uh, science of religion or the explanation of religion, and so on. All this will go on. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a feature of the, the, the world we live in that we have this concept and it's socially important. There's a demand for that. You know. But uh, scientifically, we don't have to, to treat that demand as um, too important. Just to give a, a final analogy, there used to be a great difference for people between the living and the non-living. Okay. And then we discovered that, no, chemically, there is no difference. But there are still departments of biology and departments of chemistry. It's useful in a sort of pragmatic way. But no one in the departments of biology uh, uh, believes in the élan vital or the uniqueness of the living. Yeah. So that's the same. Yeah, I, I just add that, I mean, I, I agree with Pascal that there's no such thing as, as religion as a natural kind, uh, any more than trees are a natural kind. But if we adopt the fractionating strategy that I was briefly describing and break the religious repertoire up into component elements, I think there's a very good case that some of those component elements do have evolutionary histories. So for example, uh, 
if we're as clear what we mean by the concept of ritual, for example, there's an example of a trait that uh, is very early emerging in childhood that has many kind of characteristics that suggest that it's um, an evolved and adaptive feature of human social groups. So the propensity to mimic and sponge up the uh, normative conventions of the group. Um, and we could go on and on. I mean, these are, they, these are things that have um, value for survival. Um, and, and I guess as long as we're, we're cautious and, and well, as long as we're precise about what we mean uh, by religion and which component of religion we're referring to, I think it is possible to have an evolutionary explanation. What would, what would you say yes, to that, yeah, Pascal? Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, the, 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 again, the, the point is how you fraction it and, and yeah. whether it has any causal sort of thing. I mean, we heard a, a great ethnographic case of a uh, case where it makes perfect sense because it's one of the native categories, as it were, to talk about religious activities in church and non-religious life and mm -hmm. the rest. And you know, yeah, that's perfectly fine. Um, I'm a bit more skeptical for the integration of those things. Mm -hmm. um, each of these things you just mentioned, ritual and development. We could mention, you know, the memory systems you talk about and their use in non-religious contexts. Each of them is. Um, explainable in terms that have nothing to do with religion. So, so that's where the, the term kind of loses its, its purchasing uh, advantage. As well. I mean, I would argue in the case of ritual, for example, that, that there is a distinctiveness there. So you can get um, chimps to copy behaviors where they can see some instrumental value. They can see the um, physical causal relation mm -hmm. between the act and the outcome. Um, but they won't copy easily things uh, that don't have a transparent causal structure like that. Humans will. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, uh, one, one could argue that the fact that we do that, you know, that its adaptive value was that it enabled us to demarcate groups using quite arbitrary um, uh, sort of um, identity markers mm -hmm. in the form of uh, relatively arbitrary uh, normative conventions. And um, so, yeah, so there, there's something, it would be difficult, one could perhaps connect it to language and the learning of arbitrary um, phonetic shapes as referring to features of the world and perhaps, um, you know, there, there's uh, things beyond what you might think of as ritual that would explain it, but what sure. do you think? You know, yeah. All sensible hypotheses. That should be tested. <laughs> it should be tested, <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> We still have a bit of time, so yes, here, w one question over there. <clears throat> with, with this de-essentializing of religion and its fractionating and it's sort of a, a functional analysis that ran through this, one got the sense, an implication that might be wrong is that other things simply could have taken its place, as if, if hypothetically, the African-American community had had a business <laughs> in which people were treated with dignity, it would have served those functions and one wouldn't have had the African-American church, is that conceivable? It seems like uh, the functional analysis suggests you could just sub have substituted in something else entirely for religious practices. So I, I won't presume to um be able to, to speak to sort of the evolutionary component of this. But I think in the African American community in general, um, the, 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 and the African communities that many African Americans presumably uh, derive from, the notion of the sacred is meaningful. And the, there are lots of alternatives that would not convey the same notion of the sacred. The idea of the sacred being elevated beyond uh, just a sense of what is inviolable to being linked to a, um, either a god or a system of gods is something that I if the communities out of which you come already have those sensibilities and they are not attachable to other secular kinds of structures, it becomes harder to think about easily replacing one with the other. Um, and certainly there are lots of opportunities that communities have right now to replace existing systems with other systems that might be more convenient. Religion is not convenient. It, 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 in many ways, if, the, you're, if there's a system that shifts your behavior in ways that you find 
restrictive or, or again, con inconvenient in many ways, one can imagine that if that system was easily replaceable, that it would have been replaced. So I th for, from the, my perspective, I think there, there are uh, very good reasons why communities continue to hold on to p particular strains of the sacred and the divine, because it is not only useful, but has meaning in a way that sort of goes beyond the practicalities of uh, everyday life. I don't know if that's directed to me, but I, I, what I, right, so what I'm thinking is that in um, competition between cultural groups, and I, and I guess one could say that African American religions were uh, constructed against the backdrop of very intense competition between cultural groups, one that was very asymmetric and, and unjust, of course, but nevertheless a competition of sorts. Um, the, what cultural groups do is they take what works and put them, put, you know, put them together in increasingly uh, sophisticated ways, uh, you know, under strong, sometimes very strong selection pressure. And we see this in military groups, very fast evolving uh, systems of um, organization that are best suited to defending those groups. They don't always work. Some groups get eliminated and destroyed despite their best efforts. But um, the fractionating strategy is not uh, designed to sort of say, well, we can only uh, sort of look at those traits separately in any given uh, group. If we want to understand how groups work, we have to look at systems, uh, belief systems, uh, I mean, cultural systems in the fullest sense of that. And uh, what, I, I mean, I, would, I was sort of wondering, actually, as you were talking, what elements of uh, what we think of as religion could you drop out of it and still get the effects that you're talking about? I mean, what, what is potentially superfluous? Could you imagine a scenario in which all that you described was accomplishable without Jesus in it, or without some other component. Um, perhaps not, but I don't know if that's even answerable from your perspective, whether you have it, intuitions it, about it. It's a difficult question to answer, and I think that there was a discussion about the, the emergence of new uh, forms of spirituality, and I think that is certainly true within the African American community as well as in other communities. And what happens at a small group level is very different than what happens sort of if you look at the zeitgeist. And I think, so it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, at, but it's a, it's a big cultural question, right? It's the, the question that cultural anthropologists have to struggle with around how much of the thing that you call your identity can you leave behind and still be you? Mm. And it, it, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's a question that, that uh, I certainly, I'm not prepared to answer, but I'm not sure that it's a question that as a, a, a scientific community that we've done a good enough job of being able to answer to sort of understand who we are thickly versus, uh, and how that all gets shaped as people move through time and have different existential questions that they have to address as communities. And I think for, for the African com American community, the continued presence of certain kinds of uh, Sociopolitical dynamics hold, allows us to hold on to certain uh, aspects of how we think about faith life and God. There are other changes that are, are also occurring, and I think for uh, historians of the religion, that they, they may be better able to sort of see what is changing, even if it's not being dropped out. Mm -hmm. So our understanding of Jesus is different mm -hmm. now than it was, I think, 100, 100 200 years ago, um, but Jesus is still there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. Perhaps a, um, a, a very general comment, if I can say that, and uh, if I got uh, the major point of the discussion, but even beyond that, there is always a tension between anthropology and mainstream psychology. Anthropologists, of course, they are always focused in the unique, in the very specific, in the components, in the sum components. And in mainstream psychology, of course, we do the, perhaps the opposite excessiveness by always trying to find what it is universal or quasi-universal, something like that. So yeah, what it is religion and whether we have the necessary components to religion. For some of us, it's pretty clear. Uh, means you, you need three, four components. And if you don't have these four components, you don't have religion. For instance, be, uh, believe in uh, belonging and uh, moral behavior and uh, ritual, something like that. So that's one. Uh, 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 perspective. Also, empirical uh, evidence is in favor of the idea 
that there is something beyond the, <laughs> the different components. So if we take uh, at least contemporary empirical uh, research, we see that beyond all this, even in psychology of religion, because all this uh, uh, theorization that there are many dimensions and many components and you never know what uh, dimension predicts what, uh, in its uh, group and in its uh, uh, social environment. Wow, the, the majority of the findings go uh, in favor of the idea that all these things are uh, just small uh, uh, subtle uh, specificities of a Latin variable that it is something more massive there and it is being spiritual versus non-believer, being uh, uh, believer or something uh, versus uh, nothing, something like that. So just to, uh, to come uh, to this point and perhaps try to make uh, comparisons with other domains. So if you take psychology of sport uh, or if you take psychology of um, love or sexuality, it may be also tricky, but as it is a religion, all of us, or believers or atheists, we are so much involved personally that we think that it is much more complex and much uh, easy to identify or we, we feel uncomfortable to take a very deterministic and very universalistic uh, perspective. Uh, but perhaps it's not much different than sport or sexuality or something like that. So that was uh, the point, yeah. Okay. Um. I think that we are, um, the, the session is over now, and I would like to, to thank you, um, all of you, for your uh, talks. Thank you again very much. <laughs>